and welcome to today's University of Maine Cooperative Extension Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. And these webinars are designed to deliver current USDA recommendations for preserving uh, foods at home, corresponding with what's growing in your garden and also what's for sale from local farmers. I'm Kathy Savoy, and we will also be joined today by my colleagues, Vina Lindley and Kate McCarty, live in the demo kitchen. The mission of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, home horticulture, including the ever popular Master Gardener program, 4-H youth development, food safety, nutrition, and of course, food preservation. In addition, the University of Maine is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, and reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activity. Today's webinar will focus on how to ferment vegetables. This method of food preservation uses naturally occurring bacteria to create uniquely flavored products like sauerkraut and kimchi. Before we get started, let's review a little housekeeping. <clears throat> We have our webinar set up so that you can hear and see us, but we cannot hear or see you. We do, however, want to hear from you through our Q&A box. So load that up with your questions. Um, and you can see that that Q&A feature is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So once again, thank you so much for joining us and let's get started with today's topic. So as we move into fall, it's important to remember that all the produce you preserve should be from both disease-free and frost-free plants. Starting with high quality produce will put you on the path to successfully preserving your foods. Let's start today's discussion with um, a conversation about how fermentation actually preserves food. Fermenting is a curing process that involves soaking vegetables in a brine for several days or weeks. Curing changes the color, flavor, and texture of the food, developing those signature tangy and acidic flavors that we love about fermented foods. The fermentation process produces lactic acid to help preserve the food. This acid is produced as lactobacillus bacteria, which are naturally present on vegetables, convert the sugars in vegetables to lactic acid. This acid causes the pH of the brine to drop, making it harder for spoilage organisms, things like molds, yeast, and bacteria to grow in an acidic environment. So fermentation not only produces those characteristic pickled flavors we love, but it is also creating a safe environment to preserve our food as well. To ferment vegetables successfully, you need to use the right ingredients and also control the environment the ferment is in. Namely, we're talking about temperature. The temperature that you store your ferment in plays a big role in allowing the bacteria to, th to thrive or not to thrive. So when given the right conditions, these lactobacillus bacteria will produce acid, break down the fiber in the vegetables and produce some gases. We'll tell you what to look for to ensure that fermentation is taking place and also to know when the process is finished. So the process for creating sauerkraut, kimchi, and other vegetable ferments involves shredding and salting vegetables, 
then massaging the vegetable and salt together until a brine is created from the water that is inside the vegetables and the added salt. Salt acts to inhibit, to stop microbial growth and to prevent spoilage organisms like those molds, yeast, and bacteria from developing. Once the lactobacillus bacteria produce lactic acid, the pH drops and keeps the spoilage organisms from growing. So it's important for you to recognize that salt is playing a vital role in creating a safe fermented vegetable product. It's important that you use the right type of salt as some salts have additives that can negatively impact your vegetable ferments. Anti-caking agents or iodine can cause your, brown, your brine <laughs> to turn cloudy or your vegetables to darken. Iodine can also prevent fermentation from occurring. So that's why we recommend using pickling and canning salt as it is pure granulated salt. You can use a salt that does not have additives like kosher salt, but it's best to weigh the salt to ensure accuracy so that you do not add too much or too little. Since too much salt can keep your vegetables from fermenting, while too little salt can allow for those spoilage organisms to grow. So whatever size batch of ferment, fermented vegetables you want to prepare, it's important to make sure that the container you're working in is a food grade container. So whether that's plastic, glass, or ceramic, it should have been made to hold food. For really large batches, you can use a plastic five gallon bucket, but don't think of heading to the garage for an old bucket that used to hold joint compound or kitty litter. Rather, get a food grade plastic bucket available from a beer and wine brewing supply store or your local deli or even a bakery. A good rule of thumb is that if the container originally stored food, it can safely be reused for food again. Look for the recycling symbol. It's a triangle with a number inside to determine what kind of plastic your container is. Plastics labeled one, two, four, and five are typically made to contain food. How about those ceramic cro crocs? They are made in a whole lot of different sizes as well. They are wonderful to use with your ferments. The one that we have in our office can actually hold a batch of sauerkraut made from 25 pounds of cabbage. Now that's a whole lot of uh, sauerkraut. We call it the Cadillac of Crocs since it has all the bells and whistles. It is finished with a food grade glaze. Recognize that some ceramic glazes do contain heavy metals and are not meant to come in contact with food. Um, our Cadillac of Crocs also has a channel for water that creates an airlock when the lid is in place. This helps to reduce the air circulation over the fermented product, which reduces the chances that your vegetables will spoil while allowing for gases that are produced during fermentation to escape. For smaller batches, you can use a glass jar that's either a quart, half gallon, or gallon size. After you've selected your container size, you'll need a weight that fits into your container. The weight will help to keep your vegetables fully submerged under the brine during the fermentation. This is a very important step because fermentation is in fact an anaerobic process which means it happens without oxygen. So your vegetables need to be fully submerged in the brine to properly ferment. Anything that is above the brine runs the risk of developing mold as spores from the air may land on and grow on your vegetables. In the slideshow, you can see glass weights, ceramic weights, and a new product from the Ball Company, which is a spring-operated weight. 
You can also use a plate that is weighted down with a bag of brine. In our experience, we've seen more success with the glass weights than the ceramic weights. The ceramic weights are porous and we have seen that they can be the problem in developing molds that ruin the fermented vegetables. What you'll see next in the slideshow is a picture of sauerkraut that does have the recommended one inch of brine covering the cabbage. And again, this is the desired amount of brine that's over the vegetables to create that anaerobic environment. So next up, we're gonna head to uh, visit Kate in the demo kitchen as she shows us how to start a batch of sauerkraut. Kate? Hello, thank you, Kathy, and thanks to everyone for joining us on this beautiful fall day here in Maine. So I'm gonna demonstrate how to make some sauerkraut out of this little head of cabbage I have. Uh, Kathy mentioned earlier that recipe from the recommended resources that we send along is uh, 25 pounds. So that's a lot of sauerkraut and uh, there might be some room uh, in between that huge batch and a smaller individual batch that you might wanna make. So that's what I'm gonna demonstrate is something that will fit into a quart jar and will give you plenty of sauerkraut to snack on without um, overwhelming you in the amount that you have. Um, if you have a robust cabbage crop and absolutely love this stuff, you uh, should feel free to make that giant batch. But I'll show you how to make a batch using a one pound of cabbage, which is a half a head of cabbage that I have here. So um, about the cabbage itself, to start, you can use red or green cabbage. Um, and then this time of year, the cabbages are freshly harvested here in Maine. So that means that they will have a lot of moisture in them, which is great uh, for fermenting. As we slice the cabbage and, and shred it, um, massage it, all the moisture will come out and help us create the brine that we need to submerge our, our vegetables in. If you're fermenting uh, cabbage at a different time of year, you may find that your cabbages, which were harvested in the fall, have a loss to their moisture um, due to respiration and storage. So they might not produce as much moisture as you need. And so we will discuss um, what to do about that if you find that you don't have enough naturally occurring brine um, to cover your ferment. Um, this recipe that I'm using for, again, the small batch is roughly um, two to 3% salt by weight. Um, so, as I kind of got into fermentation, I got kind of frustrated because I was like, someone just tell me how much salt that is. Um, it's about uh, one and a half teaspoons of salt for every pound of cabbage that you use. Um, it is helpful to weigh your cabbage. So you weigh it whole before you cut it up and then you take two to 3% of that. So you multiply the number of grams you have of cabbage by 0.02. And that will give you how much salt then to weigh out in grams. So it does help to have a food scale, have this food scale to weigh the um, one pound of cabbage. And then I weighed out the six, five grams of salt that I'm using, um, which again is about a, a one and a half teaspoons of salt. Ooh, I'm sorry, I got that math wrong. I'm not sure what this weighs. Um, I measured it out as one and a half teaspoons. I weighed my salt for something else that I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but again, it is helpful to weigh it because if you get the salt off, um, if you don't add enough, your, um, the spoilage organisms will, will grow. They'll have a field day. They'll say, it's not salty enough here. We're going to grow um, and spoil your product before it becomes acidic enough as the fermentation occurs to keep those germs from growing. And then if it's too salty, um, what will happen is then it, nothing will grow, including the beneficial bacteria that create the fermentation that we're after. All right, so I've got my salt, I've got my cabbage, I've got my sharp knife. And um, to start shredding, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put, um, I'm gonna wear gloves while I work on this product. So this will just help keep the germs that end up in the jar down um, in that this product is not heat treated. So we've got raw cabbage, and we're going to be just putting it in the, the jar and letting it sit. Um, so if you can do anything you can to reduce the amount of germs that go in there in the first place, you'll increase your chances of having a delicious final product rather than one that spoils and needs to be discarded. So I'm going to discard the core, chop off the stem a little bit, and then start my shredding process. You can see I've also got my mandolin slicer out. I said 
we'll see if I'm feeling brave about using the mandolin slicer on camera. Um, usually, if, <laughs> we've all, if you've ever used a man, mandolin slicer, you've uh, also probably hurt yourself on a mandolin slicer. So I'm gonna stick to the knife, but man, mandolin slicers are an extremely handy tool for getting very thin slices and would be a great application for this, this product as well. Unfortunately, my knife is nice and sharp. So um, you wanna do maybe it's real thin, like so like no bigger than an eighth of an inch. Shred the, that cabbage nice and thin. And again, this is slicing open those vegetable cells within the, the cabbage, which will let the water come out that then when mixed with the salt, will create the brine that we need to submerge our vegetables and allow fermentation to occur. Okay. So I've got it all sliced up nice and thin here. Beautiful. I'm gonna put it in a bowl with my one and a half teaspoons of salt. Don't worry, I'll adjust everything so you can see it once I get my cutting board empty here. Okay. So this amount of salt for one pound of cabbage, another good guide is to um, taste it. So once you get in there and start massaging it up a little bit and have distributed the salt throughout, your ferment should taste pleasantly salty. It's, it's not gonna get any more or less salty as it sits, like the flavor is not gonna change. So if it tastes good now, it will taste good in the future. If it tastes toxically salty, that means you've added too much. It's not going to, again, decrease its salinity as it sits. But after you distribute the salt, you could just grab a little piece and taste it and it tastes like pleasantly salted cabbage, then that's a good guide for whether you've nailed the salt ratio or not. So I'm just grabbing big fistfuls of it and squeezing it. Vini and I made that 25 pound recipe last week so I can feel my <laughs> wrist muscles aching again. I made a huge batch last week. So if you, um, you know, have any limitations with your hand strength for any reason at all, you could also use um, any sort of wooden tool here or like a little muddling tool that's sometimes used in home bartending. Um, any kind of various presses that you have to help you kind of beat up this cabbage without using your hands. So you can already kind of see how the, the cabbage is transforming. It's turning a darker green, starting to kick off some liquid as I'm physically breaking up those cells of the cabbage. And honestly, I'm not producing a ton of liquid. I haven't been at this for very long, but like I said, I've got a backup plan up my sleeve. So it's okay if there isn't a lot of liquid coming out of this. And I will admit, I think this might be a cabbage from the grocery store. So who's to say really if it's how, how recently it was picked. Could be a storage cabbage. All right. Getting a little bit of liquid out of it and the texture of the veggies is where I'm at. So I feel pretty good about moving on to the next step. So I've got a nice clean quart jar. I washed it in the dishwasher. You wash it by hand, you just really wanna make sure there's no soap residue left in it. That soap can certainly stop your ferment from occurring. All right, that's all the squeezing I got in my little arms here today. So <laughs> I call that. Hey, right, Kate, so, yes. we've got a couple of questions in the Q and A box and I wanna thank everybody who's entered some questions. 
um, that have to do with the salt ratio. Okay. So I wanted to have you address that before you move on to packing the jar. Sure. Um, so specifically the question is, um, could you please repeat the salt to vegetable ratio? Yes, and we do have this written in a slide that we'll put up after my demonstration. So it's a two to 3% salt uh, per weight. So calculate the weight of your, your vegetables and then calculate two to 3% of that and that will be the weight of your salt. And we had another question about um, the uncored cabbage that you had used as the weight. Oh yeah, that's a good question too. So the recipe um, does call for you to weigh the cabbage and then proceed with coring it and slicing it. So yes, you're right in that I did weigh that core and then discard it. There is a little bit of wiggle room, fortunately, with the amount of salt. And then one last question related to salt, and that is, so it's the size of the salt crystal that's only the concern for measuring, hence weighing. And the person commented that they do use kosher. Yeah, that's a great point too. So. We mentioned that you can use kosher or sea salt or something that will have be free of iodine or that anti-caking agent, um, but also might come in a different grind. So the salt I'm using is canning and pickling salt, which is a very fine grind like table salt. Um, and so if you're using then a kosher salt is very chunky flakes, it will measure differently if you're using a teaspoon. So if you go by weight, you'll be more precise and regardless of what kind of salt you use. That's exactly right. And then another question related to the slicing of your cabbage. So someone asked if they could use a food processor slicer. Oh, or yeah. Is that not consistent enough? No, oh, that was a great idea. Okay, so that a food processor is great to use. It will give you that nice fine slice that you were looking for. And it's yeah. a great idea, particularly if you're dealing with a large volume of a uh, cabbage yeah. like you were mentioning before. So those are all the questions for right now. So we'll take it back to wherever you are with the fermenting. Thanks, okay. Kate. Thank you. I've got my nice clean quart jar here and I'm gonna pack my sauerkraut in. I massaged it a little bit more during that question time, but this you just could be using a canning funnel too. I'm gonna do that actually. I got them right here. Canning funnel to get that in there neatly. So all the kraut, the shredded cabbage, soon to be kraut, goes in, as well as any liquid that might have accumulated in your, in your bowl. Of which, like I said, there's not a whole lot with this batch. But again, I have a plan for that. And then um, you wanna make sure there's no air in the or there's as, so what you do is you press your hand in there to press out any air bubbles that are in the that are in the sauerkraut. So again, fermentation is an anaerobic process, so it happens without the presence of oxygen. So if you get the air bubbles out of the the cabbage when you're packing it in, that will help prevent any pockets of mold forming in in the the kraut. So I'm just using the back of my hand to press it, and you can see I have a wide mouth cork jar here, which is my preferred jar to ferment in. The regular mouth jar is extremely difficult to get your hand into. You could stick a tool in there and, and press it down too if you have a spoon or something. All right, so that's um, pressed down there pretty, pretty well. Got all the air out that I could. Um, and then I've got just barely the liquid coming up to the top of the, the, the veggies to cover it. So what I'm gonna do to get that at least one inch of liquid over the top is to add some brine. So I created some brine using um, water and salt, but then I'm just gonna pour over the sauerkraut to ensure that all the veggies stay fully submerged while they're fermenting. So we don't run the risk of them molding. And the um, recipe for this is again, that two to 3% um, of salt. So I weighed my water and then I calculated how many grams of salt that is. So that's what that six grams of salt is that I'm adding. Um, a more general 
ratio is one and a half tablespoons of salt per quart of water. So that's four cups. So for four cups of water, one and a half tablespoons of salt for the brine that then you're gonna pour over your veggies. So in this case, we're using sauerkraut and we, or we're making sauerkraut and we shredded the cabbage. But this same process is what you use when you do fermented pickles. And so obviously you're not shredding the cucumbers when you make that. And so that's where you create a salt brine and submerge the vegetables under it. So if you wanted to do a, a ferment that was more of cubes of something like um, chunks of carrots or radish or whatever other veggies you wanna do, you can use this brine to take the place of the liquid that comes out of the veggies when you're shredding them. So again, one and a half tablespoons for four quarts of water for the brine. And so I'll check it out from the side. And yeah, I think I got my inch of water there. So now that I've shredded my veggies, got the right amount of salt, packed them into my approved container. What I need to do is add the weight to make sure that there's no floating cabbage in this liquid above the surface of where it's packed in. So we've got different styles. We've got the little clear glass weight that goes in. It's kind of like a paperweight. It fits right in there, weighs down your veggies. Oh, I love it, that's nice. The other style is that um, spring weight that Kathy showed you um, that then requires the lid of the jar to be put on. So if you don't have a lid, you just wanna do the little weight, this is nice and you're all done, then what you do if you're using a little weight is to just cover this up with a clean dishcloth to keep any dust or pests out of it, um, and then set it on the counter to let it ferment. If you're using the spring weight, you'll put the weight in first, and then you'll screw a lid on to help keep the spring fully submerged. So this is a lid from Ball, and you can see the thing that is most crucial in the lid is it has this little flap. So it's like got holes in the lid and then a little piece of um, silicone that covers it. So the gas that's given off during fermentation can come up out of the jar, but um, air can't get in or it reduces the amount of air coming in, um, which will help lessen the chance of it spoiling. If you're just using a regular lid, so if you came along and used like a plastic storage cap that they sell for just storing food in jars, the important thing to remember is that you need to release the gas that will build up inside this jar. If you do not burp your jar once a day, what will happen is the gas will build up until the point when this jar breaks and it will spray fermented cabbage all over your kitchen um, along with broken glass. So <laughs> if you're someone who can be very diligent about remembering to burp your jar, you can use the one piece cap. Um, if you think you might forget um, and run that risk, try and find one that allows allows it to off gas. Um, oh, I see, as I'm looking around my kitchen, I see I forgot to mention that you can add spices. I wanted to add some caraway seed to that batch. So maybe I'll go back and do that when, um, when we're done here. So we've got caraway seed. I also, you could add whole peppercorns, um, cumin seed. These are all the spices I got out to see about adding uh, mustard seed. And then we've got this giant bag of, crushed red pepper that we use when we make kimchi. That's so if you wanted spicy sauerkraut, you could add a little bit of this. Um, and I'd say you can add anywhere between a quarter to one teaspoon for your one pound batch of any kind of spice. I'll go back in and add the caraway. That's the spice that seasons rye bread. And so that will go really nicely with sauerkraut. So you can make your Reuben sandwiches later with your on your, your rye bread. All right, so this batch is ready to go. Like I said, um, it doesn't need to be covered with the dish towel because it's already got the, the lid on it. And I have a finished batch that I did uh, September 30th, and then it sat out fermenting for a week and it's been in the fridge ever since. And so you can see, I think you can see, yeah. You can see the color change, the difference in the two, the dark green and a lighter green. Um, and then of course this sauerkraut that's fully finished has a great um, smell, pickled flavor. The biggest question we get for people who are fermenting is how do I tell when my ferment is done? And the answer kind of is it's done when you like the way that it tastes. So the little bacteria are gonna do their thing in there in their little lifespan and uh, 
cause the product to acidify, to bubble, to off gas. After a while, that bubbling will slow down. You might not notice um, really that it's actively bubbling. So it might be hard for you to tell when it's not bubbling. Um, and so after a few days for a jar this size, you could start uh, testing it, stick a clean fork in there like I have here and just take a bite of it. And if you think that it's nice and fresh tasting and you want it to be done that way, you can um, just put it in the fridge. The fridge will slow the fermentation process down and kind of hold your flavors the way they are. If you want it to be a little more uh, fermented, funky tasting, you'll let it sit out for longer. So you can see here, um, this, is, this chart shows you the role of temperature and how important it is to how long a ferment takes. So we say the ideal range is between 55 and 75 degrees, and it will ferment slower at a lower temperature and faster at warmer temperatures. Um, so here in our office, it's about 68 degrees, so it's perfect for fermenting. And this court, court jar took about a week until it was ready. Um, so just after I'd say if, for a court jar size, I'd say let it sit for like five days and then start tasting it. And then at any point after that, you can uh, remove the little weight, put a, put a plastic storage cap on it, put it in your refrigerator, and it's good to go. And then on the next slide, we've got the um, batches of broken down for one, two, and five pounds um, for the salt that you need. And we'll be sure to include this in the resource that we send along afterwards so you don't have to scramble and take notes right now. <laughs> Okay, so if you are someone who ended up making that 25 pound batch of sauerkraut, or if you just make a larger quantity, um, know that you can't, this product, when it's fully fermented, is considered acidic enough to safely process using a boiling water bath canner. So you can uh, create a shelf stable jar of sauerkraut by canning it. If you're after sauerkraut for its healthy gut bacteria, the probiotic benefits, you will um, kill all of those bacteria during the canning process. That is the point of canning is to destroy any bacteria that might be inside your jars. And that will include the, those lactobacilli probiotic bacteria as well. So you'll have a delicious, nutritious fiber filled jar, but it just won't have the live gut bacteria that you might be after. So if that's the case, be sure to just refrigerate your sauerkraut and enjoy it that way. All right. I think that's it for me. Um, reviewing my notes, make sure I got everything and let's see what questions you all have. Great, thanks Kate. Um, we do have quite a few questions and we will uh, go down through those. Let's see if there's any particular order. Um, one question has to do with can carrots be fermented? or could carrots just be added to the cabbage that is going to ultimately become sauerkraut? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think of that as like the coleslaw sauerkraut. But mm -hmm. right, you could shred some carrots just on the box grater and mix those in with your car uh, with your cabbage and either um, ferment them together or you can just shred carrots and ferment them. Um, they might not give off as much brine and so that you might find um, in, you're in the situation of having to make a brine and add it to fully submerge all your little carrot pieces. All right, thank you. And then we did have one viewer um, want to confirm that it's okay to leave um, that much headspace that you had left in the jar you were preparing today. Um, and they were asking if that amount of headspace is supposed to be minimized. So do you wanna clarify the difference between um, fermenting and the anaerobic process as compared to headspace when we're talking about pressure canning or boiling water bath processing. Yeah, so the, you're right in that the jar is only about halfway filled and so it does, does leave quite a bit of air in there. Um, and so like Kathy's saying, headspace when you're canning um, at most will be an inch. Um, so it's a little bit different to leave that much space when you're fermenting. The, the finished jar that I have here was about the same headspace, like it was only about halfway full in this quart jar. And I did encounter some, some information in a publication that says um, you don't want to fill the jar up too full because the uh, bubbling of fermentation could cause it to overflow out of your jar, but that you didn't want to leave four or five inches of headspace in your jar either 
um, because it's introducing too much oxygen or air into your uh, jar. So I have seen that written. So maybe you, you read that as well and are confused that I only filled my jar up halfway. That said, I've, I've never had any problems with the amount of air in the jar. The important thing is to make sure all of your vegetables are fully submerged under the, the liquid. And then if the, um, the air in the jar is, is great, like mine is like four or five inches, um, that's okay as long as all of your pieces are exposed to said air. So really just focus your energy on making sure all of the pieces stay so fully submerged while they're being fermented. Thank you. Um, and then just to clarify that in that jar that you prepared, would there be any reason not to do two pounds in that quart jar, providing that you do have the one inch of brine above it? No, I think because I, like I said, started with half a head of cabbage. I think this completed jar is the other half. <laughs> so I did one half last week and one half this week just by chance. Um, but yeah, if I had been doing that for myself and not for an educational demo, I probably just would have shredded the whole cabbage since I had it there. And I'd rather have more sauerkraut than half a head of cabbage that I didn't know what, what to do with. Thanks. Um, and then someone also asked, um, in addition to the dried spices that you had mentioned, would it be okay to add something like fresh garlic? Oh, sure, I would. Yeah, or fresh ginger. That, that makes me think of kimchi where you're adding um, all kinds of spices to create um, a really flavor, flavorful condiment. The recipe that we frequently make has ginger, garlic, that, that spicy red pepper paste, green onion. I think that's it. Um, last week we were in a class, we made kimchi and we put garlic, ginger, uh, fresh green chilies whole with the seeds and everything and green onion in a blender and made a paste out of it and then mixed that into the um, cabbage, radish and carrot. And I bet that's gonna turn out really great. All right, um, there's two questions actually about making the salt brine. So I just wanna get these out there. We'll bundle them up together. Um, so does the salt to weight ratio that we mentioned and that was included in a slide, does it stay the same for all the vegetables, not just cabbage? Right, yes. Yep, it is the same for all fermented veggies. Okay. And then there was also another question about, is it four cups or four quarts of water to salt for the brine? It's four cups. So one quart and one and a half tablespoons of salt. Okay. All right, um, we also have a question regarding storage. So if somebody were to have like a cold closet, um, what temperature can sauerkraut be okay out of the refrigerator? So I, must, I, I think the question is once it's fermented, is it okay to leave sauerkraut out of the refrigerator? Hmm. I bet that our recommendation is to refrigerate it. Um, so like a cold storage would probably be around 50 or so. And then once, once this product is fully fermented, we do recommend you refrigerate it, which will be 40 degrees or below. So yeah, it, will con it could continue to ferment out of the fridge and you could have quality and uh, safety issues if it starts to spoil. Thanks, Kate. Another storage question is while storing your product in the refrigerator, if you don't open it to use it on a daily basis, do you still need to let out the gases? Oh, so good question. question about temperature and what's going on there. And yeah, so once you move it into the refrigerator, you should not have to worry about the burping and the risk of explosion. So um, your product will be fully fermented. It should not be giving off gas and you can put a solid regular lid on it and put it in the fridge. Um, and not be concerned about having to off gas it. Okay. Um, and then two other questions remaining in the box. And I would encourage anyone, if you still have a question, please go ahead and type it in that Q&A box because we've got time to get to additional questions today. Um, but both have to do with um, the ball products. So one person has asked if there is a blue book so that's our ball blue book is typically what that's called for fermenting that we would recommend so i have a few resources here for fermentation that we like um 
the recipes that we'll share with you, of course, are from Cooperative Extensions. As an extension, we love to recommend the research-based recipes. Um, fermentation, however, can be a little bit more, uh, you, can, you can feel more free to experiment in your fermentation recipes than you can in your canning recipes, of course. So we feel comfortable um, sending you to non-extension resources. I absolutely love this fermented vegetables. I'll follow up, I'll write these down for you all in the um, email I send you when I, we're done here by the Shockey. Kristen and Chris, uh, Kristen and Christopher, husband and wife. This is a great resource. It's super easy to use um, and user friendly for beginners. And then has fit, you can see how thick it is. Got fantastic ideas as well as um, what to do with them, which is I find really useful. Sandor Katz is the kind of guru of fermentation. Um, his art of fermentation is it's very textbook like. Um, that said, if you do get really into it, he traveled around the world. And so this is a great look at global fermented products. I think if you're a newbie, this, you would find this, this version overwhelming. Um, and then the other one we have is fermented foods at every meal, which also does a great job of um, telling you how to make things and then following up with how to use them in creative ways. So I'll send those. Um, oh, I should back up and say Sandor Katz has a beginner version. Um, I think it's called wild fermentation and it's a small um, smaller tome. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the art of fermentation unless you're really into it, but wild fermentation by Sandor Katz is great. So I'll send you those when we're done here today. Thanks. And then the second question related to, um, I think it's the ball product that you displayed. Would you kindly mention where to order the off gas lid? Um, the one that you used in the video. Yeah. So these I have seen online available. Um, you can order them online. Have you seen them in store anywhere, Kathy? I, I have seen them at yeah. large department stores. Mm -hmm. Big box retailers. Yeah, big they box. Those. Yeah. Um, so we got this as a fermentation kit. It was the jar, the spring, the lid, and then a little bag of salt with a recipe book. But I have seen sold separately the, the lids as well as the springs. So yeah, you can find those. Um, and then we have another question. What is the temperature for the curing process sitting on the counter? So this again would probably refer folks back to that chart that's part of the slideshow that they'll be receiving as part of the resources um, for after to, to refer to. Yep. And six. then there is one last question, I believe in the... Um, chat box and let me find that. Uh, someone asked if it was okay to ferment boo chow and napa cabbage the same way. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. So that's what the ones we use for um, to kimchi and the process is the same as far as the um, the ingredients. Oh, I see you say bok choy. You said bok choy, yeah. yes. <laughs> the kimchi we made last week was napa cabbage, bok choy, daikon radish, and carrots. So yeah, you can, and we'll send you a recipe and fact sheet for kimchi. So that will tell you how to make bok choy, how to use bok choy and napa cabbage in your ferments. Yeah. Um, and somebody's picking up on us using the same, curing the same way as fermenting. And um that they're being used interchangeably. And I will say, uh, I typically will see fermenting used um, and that refers to the formation of lactic acids. So um, just to, to clarify that, did you have anything to add to that, Kate? Yeah, it's like it's a curing process, but the specific action that we're talking about is fermenting and yeah. then the lactic acid within that because there's different types of fermentation, of course, that are responsible for acetic acid in vinegar and alcoholic in beer and wine. So we're after the lactic acid, um, which the without the sugar and yeasts is why we're getting um, the formation of lactic acid in our vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot to sort out. So we appreciate you hanging with us for 45 minutes and we'll, we'll send you all these resources and be available for your follow-up questions as well. Yep. So thanks so much for that demo, Kate. And our next slide shows you some of the information and our recommended resources. And once again, reminding you that you'll get these resource lists included in the follow-up email from us. We will also be sharing the main farm product directory to help you find those local produce and know how to shop directly at farms. 
Um, also be sure to check the farm's website to know how their policies have changed due to COVID. And remember that we will be back on November 9th at noon, which is our last topic for the year. And we will be discussing how to make homemade gifts from the kitchen. So look for an email with upcoming registration resources and recipes from today's topics. And that'll be sent out later today. We'll also be sending you a link to our evaluation and the certificate of completion. Complete our evaluation and provide us with your, uh, your US mailing address and we will send you a free Headspace tool, which is used in canning. So we want to say um, thank you so much. We are at the end of our 45 minute webinar and we hope that many of you will join us next month for our final 2021 webinar. So thanks everyone. Enjoy this beautiful Maine fall day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.